now I'm going to present you with one of the neatest things in the whole chapter, and don't be afraid of it. It looks a bit messy, but the idea is really, really brilliant. So what I need to do is set it up first. And we're going to set up where we're driving a wave down a transmission line, and it's hitting a load. The classic example of all transmission lines and recall that because we have waves in one dimension that this is a setup for doing all kinds of wave problems even in optics and so on anytime you just have one dimension then we can bootstrap that into two dimensions by using some additional uh, geometry and physical intuition so what do we know well, we got a simple wave, and these are for lossless lines. So we've, we're driving a transmission line with characteristic impedance Z0, and there's a load there. So what happens? There's going to be a reflection. The load could be complex uh, number, so could Z0. And so in general, the reflection coefficient is a complex number. It has some phase and magnitude. Now, we want to we want to have things kind of independent of the transmission line characteristic impedance because there's very many transmission lines of different uh, ohms, 50 ohms, 90 ohms, whatever you have. So first thing we do is we divide top and bottom by Z0, capital Z0. So we're going to get a normalized impedance of the load relative to characteristic impedance of the line. Simple. So now we do that and uh, we divide by Z0. So these become ones and these become ZL over Z0. So we just get that. And then we can rearrange that expression for ZL. And I'll just check the algebra here. So little ZL, just by cross multiplying and solving, we have the little ZL is equal to 1 plus gamma over 1 minus gamma. So no big issues there. Now, that's the reflection coefficient at the load. But we want to look back from the load at some point, say z is equal to minus l, and what is the effective, and this is what's never done in the textbooks, what is the effective reflection coefficient, not at z equals zero at the load, but at z equal minus L backwards from the load? Because we often can't be right at the load if we're doing measurements. So we want to be able to measure things back at some arbitrary distance. So let's see if we can think about it. The wave goes down to here, and so the, the phase, if we look at the, the launched wave, the forward wave, and I'll just be consistent with the book here, if we, if we take a look at the actual wave that we're launching, the book says we're going to launch a wave, Vs of Z. Now we're launching it, right? So what happens? Well, we have a V naught times e to the minus j beta z. That's where we're launching it. And we have a reflected wave coming back, and that's going to be plus gamma v naught e to the j beta z. Now, it's clear we can factor out the v naught here, but let's also factor out the e to the minus j beta z. One plus gamma e to the two j beta z. I haven't done anything yet, apparently. Now, notice that this is kind of the launch wave, and relative to the first term, there's zero phase difference. I mean, this, this guy is sitting, is multiplying that. So that's the launched wave. And the 
reflected wave, the backward wave, with phase relative to this is the phase difference between this and this, which is 2j beta z. So that means that what happens is we go e to the minus j beta z that way and e to the plus j beta z that way and the total phase that's attached to the reflection coefficient is this. Ah, so that means moving down the line, we're just changing, for a lossless line, we're just changing the phase of gamma. Oh, and then what happens to this factor? Well, let's, let's take uh, a particular example where we're actually putting in parameters. So if z is equal to zero, we're just looking at one plus gamma, which we've seen before. And at z equals minus l, we have to substitute in z equal minus l. So let's do that for the voltage and the current and see what we get. So uh, the voltage, Vs of z at z, let me get this a little better here, Vs of z when z is equal to minus l is equal to v0 e to the j beta l minus z is equal to z is minus l, so the minuses cancel, into 1 plus gamma e to the minus 2 j beta l. Now, how about the current? What's the current going to look like? Well, we know this from, from previous uh, videos. This term, V naught over Z naught, I naught. This term, minus V naught over Z naught times gamma. So, I S, sinusoidal at Z equals negative L, is equal to V naught and I see the book uses pluses everywhere to indicate it's with the forward wave, so we can put that in, doesn't change anything. V naught plus e to the j beta l, it's exactly the same, except gamma is replaced with the minus sign. And we have to divide that by Z naught. All right, so now we have a bunch of different things. Notice that um, if we take the ratio of these at, and we put L equal to zero, and we have uh, the, the ratio is going to be, uh, this is going to be in the denominator of the denominator, so it'll appear upstairs. And this thing will be 1 plus gamma over 1 minus gamma. If we take that ratio, we get the wave impedance of the line. And then if we divide that by Z naught, we're just going to get exactly this. So we could actually do that if you like. So the Z wave at the load, so Z wave at Z equals 0 is equal to capital Z first, not normalized. It's equal to the ratio of these two at Z equals zero, so that, that's like the L. We put L equal to zero, brings us back here. We take the ratio and we get Z naught into, this all cancels, that goes upstairs because this wave impedance, the ratio of the wave effects at L equals to zero, this will be in the denominator, so Z naught goes upstairs and we get one minus gamma over one, a uh, one plus gamma over one minus gamma. Now, if we divide and normalize, we get going to get little, the little wave impedance, little Z, and I think the book says, oh, they, they call it the input impedance or the wave impedance looking in from here or the normalized wave impedance, we just divide the wave impedance 
by this, and that's at z equals 0, it's equal to 1 plus gamma over 1 minus gamma. That's at, at z equals 0, z is equal to minus l, l is equal to 0. So that's no surprise. So now, let's look a little bit at what's going on here. We know what z in is at z equals 0. It's just z l over z naught. So z l over z naught is that. Now, for a problem, we usually know what z l over z naught is. It's some, some problem. And we want to see if there's a, how there's a relationship between gamma and any point along the line. And that will give us the Smith chart. So I have to do some algebra in general. So we will keep these equations on. And I will divide them. And of course that, and then I'll normalize with respect to z naught. So we will get a look at the normalized, if you like, impedance or the normalized wave impedance because there's a dynamic factor here with L. So let's, let's do that. I'm going to erase a little bit. Continuing on, we pick up where we left off. Here are the sinusoidal voltages and currents at z equals minus L, all the algebra replicated as given here. Now we're going to take the voltage divided by the current and divide by 1 over z naught. So the z naughts will cancel. That gives us a normalized input impedance in general complex r, little r, plus little jx equals this expression here. Now, uh, gamma, of course, recall is this magnitude times phase. So when we finish, we get the complete expression here. Wow, that's a real mess. Now, tell me if you can get any intuition out of that formula. Well, somebody by the name of Phil Smith in 1936 was able to do it. But let's see sort of what his idea was. First of all, when phi is equal to 0, this is just gamma times e to the minus 2j beta l. Now, L, remember, is at the position minus L, referring to the left of the load. That's what the minus is. So the distance, an actual real distance without the sign, that physical distance is L here. So if L is equal to 0, this is equal to 1. And then as you move here, what happens to this? This phase increases. So the value of gamma, which uh, the value of gamma, assuming this is zero, just the magnitude of gamma, and this is e to something that depends on L. And as L moves away from the load, the phase, this, this factor here, don't look at the minus sign, this factor here is going to do what? It's going to increase. So that means it's a rotation. That means if we look at the voltage, what does the voltage look like? Well, the voltage is in a, in a complex setting. So there's, let's call this real and imaginary. What does this look like? Well, it's 1. That's easy. That's this point here, 1, 0, right there. And now we're adding this piece to it. Wow. What happens if phi is not equal to 0? Um, 
What does this look like geometrically? Well, let's assume that L is zero, so that disappears. And this is a complex number, phase angle phi and magnitude gamma. So let's put that in. And let's, let's put it there. So uh, there's the angle. And this is this. Now, as L changes, this thing's going to rotate. So what we're going to get is a circle around like that, around the point 1, 0. Now, the 1 part isn't very interesting, except that if I'm sitting somewhere in this messy, complex plane, depending on what L is and gamma is, uh, I'm out here somewhere. And so if, I, if gamma is 0, where am I going to be? What's the size of this circle going to be? It's going to shrink to a point. It's going to be sitting right there. Well, if magnitude of gamma is 0, what happens to all this stuff? It becomes 1. Because 1 plus 0 over 1 minus 0, right? If gamma is 0, we're sitting at the point 1, 0. And what's the input impedance then, the little z in? It's equal to 1. But that's normalized, so the real impedance is z naught. Oh, this might be a way of matching z naught to zl, because we start at zl, we go back, we want to cook things up so we get z naught everywhere, and so we get a matching condition. Well, how do we do that? Well, this is where Phil Smith's genius came in. He says, well, I've got these, this input impedance, R plus Jx, and that's equal to, in general, 1 plus this gamma thing. So just look at the gamma thing, and don't worry about this, but look at the fact that we've got some general expression for gamma. This whole thing is like a gamma, so we can call it uh, 1 plus gamma over 1 minus gamma. And then all I have to do is realize that gamma in general is going to have a real and an imaginary part. So this is going to be 1 plus gamma real plus j gamma imaginary and 1 minus gamma real minus j gamma imaginary. So this gamma here, when he writes it like this, can represent an arbitrary combination here. So if you like, you could write this as um, when, L is, when L is equal to 0, it's just what we know. It's our starting point. Then as we move around this circle, all it does is rotate the phase of gamma that we started with. So we just need to know how we get the real and the imaginary parts from this thing here. The one, the one way you can think about it is that this whole thing is a new gamma, but all we've changed is the phase factor. So all we're doing is rotating on this circle, moving around on that circle for a fixed radius, and that radius is given by gamma, which is this gamma, which is we know how to calculate that from before. Now you have a lot of algebra to do and to find out what r and x are. So when you do that, you get families of funny circles. And that's what we're going to look at in uh, follow-up to this, is what do those circles look like? And how do we use those circles to do calculations? It's all based on this plus some in geometric intuition here so we need to understand how gamma works relative to the point 1, 0, because that's where we always want to get to. So when you're wandering around in this complicated mess here, which turns out to be called a Smith chart, you always want to end up at the center of the Smith chart circle. 
And at that point, everything is matched because Z in is equal to 1. 